Hello and welcome back. We're on the last episode, which I'm really sad about. It's episode four, which is sustainability and ethics. Now we've gone through the last three episodes, which was really exciting store concepts. And um, we had merchandising and display. We had people in retail and now on sustainability and ethics. So as part of this four part series, if you want to check out any of the previous episodes, they're available and the links are below. You can listen to them on the podcast channel or you can watch it back on the YouTube channel for the videos as well. Um, I'm joined by my co-host, which is the amazing Tim Radley, and he's owner of VM Unleashed and author of Retail in the Meaning Madness. Um, So, Tim, we're going to talk about sustainability and ethics, and it's something that I'm not 100% uh, understanding of, I think, even as a consumer or as a retailer, there's a lot of noise out there with it. And before we came on, we were just talking around, I suppose, what it means as a retailer, if you do have a business, uh, sustainability is quite a broad word. So how do we maybe look at uh, narrowing that down to understand it a little bit better? Great. Well, uh, hello, Louise, again. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, that one question could probably last a whole 40 minutes, I think, Louise. Um <laughs> It's part of one of the problems if you're trying to get a sustainable message across or, you know, what is sustainability? I think in its broadest sense, people would understand it as um, more to do with the product itself and the supply chain behind it. The, The product I'm bringing you is made in a sustainable way in so much as it's probably from raw materials, which are... Uh, sustainable recyclable the supply chain is not kind of pumping out you know enormous amounts of pollution and you know products crossing you know halfway across the world to get to you Um, and that when I get the product itself I can recycle that in due course or whatever I think most people if they think about sustainable products and businesses and retailers they kind of that's the focus of it Um, Within that, there's the different ways of selling or not selling. I think fundamentally the aim of sustainability, it does without doubt do a huge amount of damage to the to the world, to the environment. Uh, it contributes to climate change. All my facts are close, but they might be a little bit fuzzy because the data kind of changes so often. But I think if you took the retail industry and it was a country, I think it's carbon emissions would make it like the second or third highest uh, contributor, you know, in the world. So it it is a very kind of damaging industry. The amount of product that goes into landfill, you know, or is incinerated. And again, all the issues uh, with that. Um, That's why retail has become a focus of sustainability, because, you know, it is damaging uh, in many ways. Fundamentally, for all the details that we talk about, it really is about buying less things or perhaps more accurately, producing less things. Because, again, that's another big argument, you know, and think about it yourselves in your own lives. You know, have you actually got enough stuff? Christmas is not far away and I'm not trying to say don't go out and buy things because we still need to go and buy things and it's important I think to have new things it's not just a practical thing Um, you can live in the same jump for 20 years on a practical level but you know to have some uh, kind of emotional um, positivity from retailing is very important but there are ways to do it that don't create this big, big problem for the world. So, for example, within that big answer, if you like, uh, rental. People renting products rather than buying um, uh, products. Still new products, but renting is one avenue which is growing a lot. Um, Reuse. So... um, what we call or called second hand, but is now very much pre loved, vintage, etc., um, is in certain groups. I mean, I'm talking, I suppose, 
uh, UK, and I'm talking kind of southeast and London here, but actually there is this this figure as well that they think that half of by 2030 in London there'll be more second-hand pre-loved purchases than fast fashion. That's a prediction I've seen from various quarters. So in certain areas, there's a real momentum and a real kind of glamour, you know, teenagers, students, you know, that in fact, you know, you can buy, a, I don't know, particularly sports brands, Nadidas, Ike, you know, really iconic products which were made in the, you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago, which are now very, very sought after. Um, and even products which are reworked. You know, King uh, Brick Lane in London, which was very much the place where you went for an Indian meal uh, 20, 30 years ago. That was its history. But now is is a huge centre for vintage clothing. So not only do you get, you know, people who collect vintage clothing and they resell it, but you have people who literally get two or three pieces of adidas that can't be used anymore and then they create something new out of them so there's all kind of creation in it so you know rental all of this kind of second-hand market uh development of new materials which are sustainable recyclable uh materials um just simply wearing things for longer there's a really interesting group of people emerging on linkedin who help people work with their wardrobes. You know, uh, there's this other horrific fact, which is, uh, again, related to London, but it's um, how many pieces people have in a wardrobe and how many pieces, you know, something like 25% they never wear. Um, We've got into this kind of just buying, buying, buying. So these people go and they literally don't take you into a shop this is what you need to buy. They literally take you into your bedroom and empty your wardrobe and say, right, this is really good. And this is really in now. And if you mix that with that, with that, then you've got, you know, it's training people as well. So there's all kinds of initiatives, which you could say are sustainable. But at the bottom of it, I think it really comes down to producing less new products making more money from existing products, Um, you know, and that's why obviously with the inherent less pollution, less damage uh, that's involved in that, that's why sustainability has become this growing kind of uh, message, particularly I think from, you know, the younger generations, although absolutely this is not a generational thing. You've got people who've been, you know, working sustainably for years and years and decades. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. And what you said there, the producing less. And it's, I think it was on, there was an article there recently where, where Zara, the, the clothing brands are now, they're fixing clothes. If you have maybe damage, you can bring them in and they will, you know, they'll rework them as such. And that, that again will will make that piece of clothing or that garment last that bit longer, um, which again feeds into that whole sustainability thing. And I think it's small things sometimes, I think, um, and recapping on what you said there, Tim, it's, you know, there, there is a lot in sustainability, but I think it's looking at the everyday things we do and making those small incremental changes that really have that, I suppose, that long-term impact. And rental was one that you brought up, which I thought was fantastic. And we're seeing that happen now a lot more, which we would never have thought about, uh, you know, five, 10 years ago. It was very much fast fashion. Um, secondhand, uh, again, a big change there, uh, vintage clothing, uh, which is, you know, real on trend I suppose as well when you look at it and um, I love that idea of people going in and reworking your wardrobe and uh, you know looking at how they can style it and make use of that 25% of stuff that you never use I'd say it's probably a little bit higher for me personally um, because I definitely think it's it's definitely needed uh, and there is great stuff there that you can reuse again I think looking at I suppose and I get asked this question a lot, Tim, and, and, you know, smaller retailers sometimes 
don't really know what to do, I suppose, from an everyday piece in their business to be a little bit more sustainable. Um, And it doesn't have to be something massive. But do you have any kind of ideas that you could give any maybe smaller stores there, small independents, maybe they just have a single site store and they're looking to be a little bit more sustainable in how they manage their business? Yeah, I mean, um, say sustainability, people tend to focus on the product and the supply chain um, and where it came from. So uh, that's a good starting point for any business of any size is if you can actually, you know, delve deeper into where your product comes from and who makes it, who delivers it. Um, And I appreciate that, you know, smaller businesses cannot always change uh, wholesale, literally, you know, where their product comes from. But that's a good place to start is to actually, you know, see the the supply chain to your uh, actual shop and see if there are alternatives. You know, if, if you're in the food business, then there probably are alternatives there, more local, you know, suppliers, more um certified organic suppliers etc cetera, etc cetera. um whereas if you in the more mass merchandise not so easy or fashion as well but that's one place to start but the other thing is actually how you behave how you run your business you run your shop how you engage with the the world around you as a shop in a location will say as much about your um you know your views uh, on sustainability as anything so um, things like you would do at home so as an individual so how much of the packaging you recycle uh, the energy use um, very topical at the moment but also how you interact with the world around you so you know do you volunteer do you do things or your team do things with the local community local environment um, you know, whether it's kind of picking up litter, whether it's getting involved in building footpaths, whether you drive to work um, or whether you actually cycle to work. Um, I've come across several retailers in smaller towns I've worked with whose seems their primary aim in the morning is to get their car in front of their shops because there's not much parking. Well, firstly, if you cycle, if it's possible, instead of driving, that's kind of probably better for you and the environment but also frees up space for shoppers to actually park in front of your shop you know which has to be a priority so you know how you live your life how your shop lives its life can be very sustainable as well and you know this again you see in some of the big businesses so even if you're small it's important to look and see what's happening so for example a brand like Timberland in their contract with their shop workers. Um, There are a certain number of days a year where you're paid to go out and volunteer. And you go out and volunteer generally on environmental products. So typically and historically, they help to build footpaths, green spaces within cities and towns where they had a shop. There are other brands, a brand called Sperry's, I remember, in the uh, the US, who make shoes and particularly boat shoes they're really famous for. And every week they would be down on the beaches collecting rubbish, um, you know, and helping the environment in that way. So, yes, you know, the product that you have in your shop, you know, where it comes from is really important. But if you're selling third party product, that might not be as easy to change but the way you you actually kind of act within the environment, within the community is really important. But, you know, on the subject of rental, that doesn't necessarily have to be, <coughs> excuse me, a big brand thing as well. So, for example, um, you can, let's say, sell something, let's say a dress or something for £80, and you kind of can sell one. If it's a really good product, which is kind of of the season, so people want it, but they don't want it, (coughs) excuse me, all the season, then potentially you could rent that out, you know, several times, maybe 10, 15 times for £20 each. (coughs) So for one item, you can have the initial £80 that you sell, 
or you can kind of rent it out several times and actually make a lot more money from it. Um, so that's, uh, Louise mentioned Zara, that's something that the kind of the uh, economics now start to work for a business like them. Um, and it's interesting now, Zara is a really good kind of, you know, guide as to where the world is going. And they kind of, you know, to a certain extent, invented fast fa fast fashion. But now they are renting products through third parties like Higher Street. It was announced this week um, that actually they're into the second hand or that that's kind of coming along. And interestingly, that's going to be in shops in the UK, which I think the UK is kind of like a, you know, at the head of uh, a lot of this kind of sentiment around sustainability. So, you know, it will be a balance. What you've had is specialists who rent, specialists who remake, specialists who uh, resell. And those people will still be there. They're very important and that's what they do. But I think in the bigger brands, and why not in smaller third-party brands as well, you can have a little bit of, of different things. Um, ultimately, you're still being commercially successful, but you're maybe not buying so much product yourself. You're making it from a kind of a, a variety of ways. So I wouldn't disclude anything because you're not a huge kind of multi, you know, international business. But the fallback, as I say always, is how you live your life, how your shop lives its life, and the impact it has on your local environment. You know, we can't all save the world, but, you know, maybe we can help a little bit with the town that uh, we have our shop in. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot at the moment around, I suppose, retail businesses. Um, with this B Corp status and um, some of them have you know and, and I'm seeing it come through online and for anyone that maybe isn't too familiar what that is or what that's about Tim can you give a little bit of insight into what that kind of that B Corp even means uh, we know it's obviously a certification of some kind um, for you know for those sustainable businesses but what I suppose what that means maybe or is it the case that some businesses need to be working towards that or what what's your take on it? Um, it's very it's at the early days and it's mm. it's very important because one of the big problems with um, sustainability is transparency and actually mm -hmm. finding the truth yes it's difficult to know who to buy from what to buy if it's not clear so the b corp is like a certification uh, which is given after a business has to um, be assessed in a very detailed way not in all of the issues we've talked about, so not just supply chain, the product, but, you know, the carbon footprint of the business, the way it uses energy. Um, so all of these issues, uh, you know, it's very stringent um, that you will be given this certification to prove that, you know, you actually, you know, follow all of these guidelines. You are of a certain level. The problem being, I guess, in, particularly now in its evolution, is that the public don't really understand or appreciate what this means. There, you know, there are quite a number of certifications out there, and so for the customer, unless they're actively looking, you know, if they hear something is a, a B Corp or something else or something else, Soil Association, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, what that actually means. So, it's a growing thing, and. You know, governments can play a part in this because, you know, for many, many years now, when you buy an electrical uh, appliance, you know, a fridge or something, when you buy a house, you have a, a kind of a, a very standardized assessment of all the different kind of energy consumptions, et cetera, about your machine. So some products, it is there. Other products like fashion, there's nothing exists at the moment, anything like that. So that's very, very uh, difficult um, but it's interesting it's moving on to businesses now because you know what the internet has done obviously in social media is that we now know a lot more about the businesses 
So it's not just about individual products. Do I love this product? Do I like it? Actually, do I like the business um, you know, that, is, that is making this? So these B Corps are very, very important as we move uh, forwards. And you're also getting the other side, which is um, investigation of claims. So not just about having the certification, but there are now, uh, both in Europe in the UK, for example, ASDA, ASOS, Boohoo in the UK are under investigation and assessment uh, by the, the Marketing Commission about their use of the word sustainability. For example, it's too vague when they apply it to something, maybe one of the products, not all of them, satisfy um, what sustainability means. So, uh, and in Europe, um, brands like uh, H&M, Decathlon, have also been pulled up by the European Union authorities about making these vague claims about being sustainable uh, or not. So it's an area which is developing and I personally think this kind of standardization is really important, which is what B Corp is definitely trying to do in the UK in terms of businesses, so that you get a very clear understanding, whether it's a product or whether it's a business, exactly. Not even how sustainable it is in a vague way, but specifically in terms of, you know, the supply chain, the carbon footprint, et cetera, that you can actually understand. Uh, individually i mean there there are brands out there um you know which when you buy them will it will show the supply chain so it will you can see exactly where it came from where the raw material came from where it was produced and then you can look at the the factory data where it was produced how much the employees are paid how much they you know they they work etc um so it is out there. And um, again, the other extreme, we had a documentary last week on Channel 4 about Sheen. This, um, I'm trying not to give my personal opinion on it, but it is like the mega fast fashion brand, uh, you know, or originating from China. And in this uh, documentary, it was saying that um, per garment that you buy, sheen workers maybe get three pence or three cents in Ireland per item. They have one day off a month, you know. Um, so the more that we know about these things, the more transparent, um, the more that the marking is sustainable, then all of this will help. And, you know, at the end of the day, if it doesn't bother you as a customer, then that's your personal choice. But I think the fact that we see big brands, you know, like Zara, like Primark, Primark, all, they're on their way, you know, it's work in progress, but they're all seeing the ethical commercial sense in starting to adopt you know, these kind of sustainable ways of producing product and selling it. So it is a movement. It is growing and growing and growing. I think the younger generation is really going to push him for it because it's their world, you know, as we move forward more than ever. So, yeah, B Corp, it's a very important part of a pretty complex picture, which needs kind of simplifying as we move forwards. I think you touched on ethics there um, just slightly towards the end there when we're talking about sustainability and you you know you mentioned before about sustainability and ethics and how how I suppose you can't have one without the other um, in, in a business. Absolutely yeah I mean um, yeah. I think businesses are kind of good or bad um, and I can't believe, as I mentioned to you, I cannot believe the business that treats its staff really poorly, um, ethically, you know, is not a good business, but is fantastic at sustainability, just doesn't make sense. You know, if uh, if a business is governed well with the right values about how it treats the world and everything in it, then they're going to have a sustainable supply chain as much as possible. 
they're going to treat their staff well they're going to want their staff to be engaged in the whole kind of sustainability uh thing as well so you know governance um environment ethics all of these come together um and so you know it's why when we look at that supply chain we're not just now wanting transparency in you know where did the cotton come from who grew it did it deplete some local uh water source you know like it, it is in uh in various places in the world to get that cotton to me but all the people who work in that chain the people who pick the cotton the people who uh you know send it to the factory etc the people who work in the factory are they treated in a in a good way so you want transparency uh all the way through this to decide whether you you like a business or you don't like a business um and it 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 goes right the way through. I mean, Patagonia is, uh, in many ways, is a great example of a sustainable business um, in the way that they've always kind of sourced their, their products as, as they go through. They had a famous, famous advert where they launched a new jacket and the, the kind of the advertising line was, do you really need this jacket? It's a fantastic jacket, but... You know, have you got a jacket already that will do the job? You know, well, you know, it's here if you want it, but really, really. And I th- it was a genuine, it'd be easy to kind of, you know, do that from a marketing perspective, but it fits in with the whole ethos of their brand. And uh, just very recently, uh, the owner has sold the business, um, but he sold it to a trust so that it's it's sold to a trust and the trust must invest profits into the environment, environmental projects, environmental companies trying to improve, you know, the world. So, um, you know, from top to bottom, from beginning to end, product, climate, people, you know, that's kind of one business, which has always kind of been very consistent in, you know, how it approaches everything. And, you know, going back to the question of smaller retailers, you know, you've, you've got the opportunity to on your particular high street, you know, not just to be the best clothes shop, the best butcher, but you're the retailer, which is the one that is, wow, as a business, how it treats people, how it volunteers, how it interacts with the community, how it sponsors local things, how it recycles, how it always uses bikes, you know, all these things, yet that, that can make you the number one, the destination as a good retailer. And as we go forwards, people, are, and particularly after COVID, being a good retailer is really important. And it's a, it's a USP in itself. Yeah, I think... I don't know what your take is, Tim, but 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 I felt for a while that the word sustainability was a buzzword for a while and probably used in a lot of marketing campaigns as a as a, as a bit of a driver um, when maybe launching products or things like that without people having, I suppose, an understanding of. And I think you touched on it there that sustainability and. Um, can mean very different things for different people with different businesses and I think going back to what you said there in the B Corp and and um, having that transparency which is really really important around around businesses I suppose talking about businesses that are doing that sustainability piece really well and we had a little uh, chat about this before and you brought up a couple of businesses that are really I suppose understand sustainability really well but are really doing it and one of them was a, a denim company and um, I'd love for you to discuss um, that particular company and what they're doing Tim. Absolutely. I'm just going to plug in my computer, everybody. I'm saving saving energy. <laughs> but, if, but if I don't flick that switch, I might disappear. So that's better. That puts my mind at ease. Um, yeah, so, I mean, you know, I meet a lot of people through LinkedIn. And I have to say the number one subject and people getting in touch and responses to posts is all around sustainability. You know, all of the aspects 
of it. And it's across all countries. You know, I get a lot of people, Italy seems to be a hotbed of interest. Obviously, the UK, Ireland, but America, you know, everywhere. And a younger group of people fascinated by it. And one of the uh, the people I met there was uh, a lady called Marie Nancaro, who, who's in Ireland in Belfast. And she has a business called Titanic Denim. Um, so she's a denim specialist historically, and she basically upcycles denim into new products, particularly bags and accessories. Um, and she's made these amazing bags, which... The fundamental bag itself is denim, but she's also managed to find uh, secondhand vintage, for example, uh, seat belts from little Fiat 500s. And so she's made the handle of the bag, you know, from these seat belts. I mean, it's uh, it's kind of fantastic. Um, so there's an example of a small person with a passion who has created this brand and they're, they're they're recycling, they're upcycling uh, materials. Um, and there's a shop just opened in London, uh, right in the heart, just off Oxford Street, called The Good Store. And so her products are now in that shop. And next to, right next to it, which is fabulous, because another one of my favourite brands, which I think I mentioned before, Elvis and Cress. So they're the ones who make uh, bags and accessories from hose pipes which the London Fire Brigade um, don't use anymore when they've had their time they take the rubber and the materials they treat them and then they create uh, these accessories where if you're lucky on your bag you get the name of the fire station that it came from which is printed on the original hose pipe um, and just going back to that whole process so they they take these uh, hose pipes from the fire brigade and uh, I think 50% of profits that they make goes to the fireman's uh, retirement fund. So, again, this whole thing about, you know, sustainability, ethical. And also they create a community um, as well. And community is really important around this. But if you get into the models like renting. So another one of my favourite brands which is more recent is a rental brand called Lonehood and if like me you know and it was the case up until relatively recently rental was something you did with pretty expensive products and maybe a special occasion so the classic you know is the wedding I rented my suit and I've only got luckily well I touch wood I've only been married once so it was a good move so I rented, uh, you know, from Mospros, which was like the classic kind of rental company. But a lot of people was, you know, that was rental. So how do you get young people, people who are, are addicted in the nicest possible term to fast fashion? And they need this continuous kind of excitement. So Lonehood uh, was set up by three ladies who were in the fashion industry. I think they worked for Topshop, various other businesses and didn't like the way the business worked, didn't like the way the products came from, didn't like the volumes of product that were being produced and sold. So they kind of stepped back from that and set up this thing called Lonehood. So Lonehood is a, it's an app. And the key thing behind it is they are creating a community of young people who still love fashion, they still want to wear something different every week. But the way they do it is that this community of basically lenders and borrowers, and everybody is a lender and a borrower. So it's kind of like this uh, juggling, you know, for next weekend, I'm going to borrow that because I want to wear that and you can lend that and so on and so on and so on. And so that kind of opened up my eyes because the branding is very youthful. You know, it's very kind of hip, very kind of uh, on trend. But the community thing really makes sense. And you can also get, you know, young designers in the picture, lending products as well. Um, and it works for everybody. It means you can go out, you can still wear something different 
every week, but you don't necessarily have to buy anything new for that. You can make money. So you're spending less on new products. And also you can make some money, you know, on actually kind of uh, renting your products out as well. And also these communities can be ultimately local. So part of their marketing is to go to young areas like Glasgow, Liverpool, London, uh, you know, where they're, they're kind of based. And um, so you can even have, this really is going back, some great things come, you know, you could have parties, you could have events where you meet up. So you don't even have the cost of, you know, sending packages through the post because it could almost be a, a relatively local community that are lending and borrowing. I love that I'm a lender and a borrower at the same time. And again, it sounds cool when it's dressed up in the right way. So that is is a really kind of fantastic um, brand. And another example, just while we're on individual retailers, there's a shop open just off Regent Street, Carnaby Street, which is a Levi's shop. And it's called Levi's House, H-A-U-S. And in this shop is all about those different ways of selling and supply chain. So what they have there, anybody who's interested in Levi's, this is amazing. So you can go through their archives, their books of all of the products which they've kind of made, you know, over the decades. And for example, they have up there, you know, all the 501s. And for example, there was one 501 that had a zip. 501s are known for their buttons. But in fact, one was a zip when you couldn't get hold of the, the metal for the, for the buttons. So that's quite collectible. There's another one where instead of stitching on the pocket, it's painted. Because again, I think this was related to the Second World War that you couldn't get the the, the stitching. So they literally painted the stitch on. So what Levi's do is they, re, they recreate some of these real iconic products in limited assortments every year. They're literally working their way through their catalogue. So um, they're kind of, there's no waste. It's kind of, you know, small collections. There's always a waiting list and people buy them. The other part of the shop is they've scoured all of their factories, offices, all the samples and things that were made, which are kind of hanging around, which they never sold because maybe there was a button missing or there was a bit of stitching that wasn't quite there. And in this, uh, this shop in, off Regent Street, there is a kind of a little factory, work, uh, a workroom below. So all of those products are now for sale. So they're basically upcycling all of this product that would go to waste. And if they're not using the products, then they're using the denim itself to kind of create new products. And you can also go in there and you can take in your existing Levi's and you can have them repaired. You can have adornments put on, personalization, et cetera. So there isn't a new, you know, product in there which doesn't have some kind of, you know, um, limited collection you know no waste and much of this story is about recycled materials upselling upscaling and repairing so um it's a fascinating shop if you're near there and it's kind of again another big brand who now understands and they're touching like these different ways uh, of being sustainable and actually just one one other point before i let you ask another question louise but it makes sense for a brand like Levi's and also the sports brand. We mentioned earlier, you know, what was happening with secondhand Adidas and Nike to embrace this because individuals and small entrepreneurial businesses are already embracing this. As we said earlier, if you want to go and get vintage Adidas, if you want to go and get vintage Nike, if you want to go and get vintage upscale Levi's you can go to any number of kind of particularly in London you know selling Brick Lane you know shops where you can buy these so it makes sense for Levi's to embrace their history embrace the products that people have already bought 
and again create this community you know if you love levi's and you want to repair if you love levi's you want to personalize if you love levi's and you want to kind of revisit an old uh, classic iconic product come to levi's um because there is business which is going and which is being spread out you know quite rightly amongst this second hand market so altogether i think it's a really vibrant kind of dynamic world when you consider what's happening there where customers brands you know are kind of working in kind of a symbiosis but what they're all doing is they're kind of keeping products in the market one way or another for much longer than you would do traditionally so that's you know that's uh, all of those you know loan hood what levi's are doing I think it's really kind of exciting. And I think a lot of people find it exciting. It's not kind of dull environmentalism, if you like. It's really active, dynamic, real, you know, and you can all play your part in enjoying products, but actually also, you know, helping the the planet and everything else. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And I think, um, you know, you touched on there, you know, and I love that idea of the lenders and the borrowers and they're in this community of sharing out, you know, uh, what is it? One person's uh, trash is another person's treasure, whatever that slogan is. You know what I mean? That, that yeah. other people will, will really enjoy having that um, upcycling kind of movement that seems to be happening at the moment. I suppose... And we we talked about loads of different, you gave so many great examples, Tim, um, and, and there was really great ones there, I think, you know, and, and just kind of touch on a little bit of them there. We talked about rental, um, we talked about renting clothes, the likes of Zara, other chains, and um, doing that, the secondhand movement, which we talked about there, and Loanhood was an example that you used there, and um, reworked um, clothing. So again, um, retailers that are, you're, you're bringing your garments back and they're maybe getting repaired in-house by that particular retail brand that you bought off and then again looking at materials that are recycled um, and upcycled more so and you touched on a couple of examples there as well I suppose and then this idea of people coming in helping you rework your wardrobe as such to reuse and recycle what you have instead of going out and buying more and um, looking at producing less um, and you touched on Timberland that have it built in their contract that you can volunteer um, as part and it's a paid volunteer piece as part of their contract to go out and support their local community but as well to, to tie in with that it could be on a beach cleanup thing it could be an environmental piece um, that they're doing there and um, to drive that I suppose their their focus or those, those values within that business we talked about b corp status what that means and um, again um understanding i suppose and having that bit of transparency in you know what that sustainability is in a business piece and, and what metrics you need to have within that and understanding that a little bit better we talked about supply chain and um, with stores wholesalers um and I suppose, how you run your store in a day-to-day operating piece. So it could be your packaging, how sustainable that is. Um, I know some people are using, um, I think it's, is it sugar beet as a plastic um, as opposed to actual plastic, which is biodegradable. So different, different uh, materials you can use there. I know some people are using seaweed packaging, which again is compostable. So looking at different areas like that and um, energy consumption in your business. I know it's a hot topic at the moment, but again, um, understanding how that is, how sustainable that is um, and doing those basics, I suppose, right um, and understanding that a little bit better in your own business. And um, you you said there's three areas um, around sustainability, products, climate and people. So I think if we looked at those three main components and broke them down in your business today, you know, what what deliverables or what actions could you take within those three components to really be more sustainable? And you talked about maybe a cycle to work scheme that some of the governments do that now for businesses um, and some of them are subsidised. So maybe it's a cycle scheme piece. Um, you know, maybe it's uh, not parking the car in front of the shop, uh, you know, different things like that. Um, and then you talked about businesses that are reusing products, um, seat belts, um, fire hose pipes were some of the examples you gave, which I think are absolutely 
amazing and really, really interesting because I think if I said to anyone, I'm using a seatbelt or a fire hose there and you're going to get an amazing product and show them the after project, I think they'd be wowed. I think that's really, really interesting. Um, the time goes by really super quick because you've so many stories, Tim. I don't think you realize uh, once, once you get on them and they're really, really interesting. I think I'm recapping on those now so that people can maybe listen back, pause, maybe take a couple of notes on what you've discussed and maybe look at generating their own ideas in their own business. We talked about some of the ideas that are happening in small and large retailers, but maybe how can they bring some of those ideas to life or maybe look at implementing similar strategies in their own business? Before we finish up, I suppose, is there anything else you'd like to add? We've kind of talked, I've done a bit of a synopsis there. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Because I know this is your, your main area of, of expertise. Um, yeah, I was thinking, I was hoping you were going to give me just a few more minutes, but it's about the supply chain and yeah. in the inventory. I mean, for retailers of all size, this is, you know, it, it's a, you know, it's the core of the business and, you know, it relates to cash flow. So if you're a small business, you know, the investment you need to make in product, you know, is, is big and it's, it's kind of on the, the chance you'll sell it. Sometimes it's more certain than others. So this inventory model is changing, and this is directly linked to sustainability and waste, et cetera. But, you know, the existing or traditional model is, is kind of the commitment model. You do what you can, whether as a retailer in a town center or a multinational, to try to work out what the customer will want to buy next month, next season, next year. But more or less, you commit, you know, and sometimes a punt will pay off safe product you'll be OK with. But it's also things that we get wrong as well. So, you know, that's a big kind of bet and it involves a lot of money. If you start to move some or more to this kind of on demand, what you're literally doing, of course, is you're not committing to buy in until somebody is going to buy from you. And I'll give you an example, which again is fairly much in its infancy, but is is extraordinary if it really gets foothold. And this is digital printing technology. Uh, there's a company up in the north of London. I have no affiliation, but I'll say their name. They're called Cornet because you should go and have a look at the website and visit. They have these enormous digital fabric printers and so it, they're already used for example you know if you sell an array of t-shirts and it's got everything from the rolling stones kiss you know whatever on it um instead of having to commit up front to x amount of each you can just you know on your website these are the options and then you give a, a business like Cornet the designs the type of uh, T-shirt, colour, etc. And they will literally print. Print so you don't know it's printed. We're not talking you know, like a photocopy standard here, but an extraordinary kind of, um, you know, really, really good quality. And that can come off your website. It's out the door and it's sent to the people who want to buy it. And, um, you know, you get the money. Um, and you didn't have to put anything up front, you know, in particular. And that, but that has now been developed to extraordinary technologies now, which, um, for example, you have on your address, uh, sorry, your address, your website, this dress, and somebody wants to buy it. So, yes, they click the button, et cetera. Again, using similar technology and process, you can literally have the pattern of that product printed onto plain material so you're literally printing fabric and you're printing pattern on fabric a laser printer in about five seconds cuts out all the pieces and then adjacent there's kind of like a seamstress college a local kind of um, initiative to to give people work which is fabulous in itself so you can have a dress that only existed virtually that arrives again on your in your uh, home 24 hours later that was printed from scratch. 
there's no supply chain which went halfway around the world to produce this fashion item. There's not the pollution on that. So this whole kind of, I have a virtual assortment online. It doesn't exist, but you can buy it. But as soon as you buy it, the wheels go into motion and then you can have it. And again, it means you commit to marketing, selling a virtual assortment, but you don't necessarily have to kind of commit to the physical stock and make those kind of gambles up front. So it's a very good cash flow proposition. So I think this committed assortment moves to a virtual, whether the customer knows it or not, on-demand product. But I think bespoke, knowing that you're waiting a little bit longer for something made just for you is also a really, really good proposition for businesses to have. And again, you don't have to invest until somebody is committed. You know, and the world of digital printers, depending on, you know, what area that you work in and what type of product you're selling is something which, again, can create literally something from nothing. But for example, you know, if you were in a DIY shop and you needed little kind of screws and bolts and, and whatever to do your job, then it's feasible. Again, you virtually order and these things could be printed 3D, either in a local shop pickup place, ultimately even in an office or every kind of new group of houses and businesses might have a digital printer. In which case you're completely cutting out, you know, a lot of the pollution and, and the distribution issues. So, you know, some of that might sound like science fiction, but when you're a, either a big retailer or a small retailer, keep an eye on this inventory issue. Do I really need to commit all my money up front to buy product to put in my shop? Or do I just need to invest some? And the rest I can kind of work with intelligently, but critically I can invest it when I know somebody wants to buy it. And that, you know, is a, so that makes a whole different perspective on, you know, the commerciality of your business as say the cash flow, the investment profitability, but also of course it means that there should be less waste ultimately less pollution in the whole kind of supply chain process. So it's sustainable. I wouldn't say accidentally, but it's sustainable from the back of commercial common sense as well. So, you know, particularly these days, there's this very, you know, with the cost of living, sustainable products can be more expensive than non-sustainable, you know, mass market products. So, um, but going forwards, you know, there can be ways where actually making profit as a retailer do actually link to being sustainable. And for the customer as well, you know, they get uh, the benefit of uh, the product that they want, no returns, you know, and hopefully, you know, buy less product and use them for longer as well. So the supply chain technology, you know, is a real area to watch because that's going to help with um, the wider kind of sustainability issues yeah yeah and I think that's really interesting I think looking at I know a number of years ago mother care for you know a lot of their products or car seats it was all you had to order them so because they they just on site they didn't have that space to house all of those larger products that so you would you would have the iPad and you know you'd have that team member in that particular area of the store and they would order through the iPad those bigger items I think for a long time there was the perception that if you didn't have all of the clothing and all of the sizes that people aren't going to buy it but I think uh, you know next have a great uh, in-store ordering service and so does a lot of other companies and I think that that whole idea of ordering is and I think we're now a little bit more adjusted to online where we are so used to that now that I think it's a model that people are now more than ever probably have more of an appetite for that for, for sure I think mm, yeah. absolutely no surprise next is one of the people who are adopting the kind of on-demand model as well you know for their uh, gift items 
And I'd be surprised again, you know, with generic T-shirts with different mm. patterns, it makes complete sense. You know, why invest in 20,000 Rolling Stones and 30,000 Kiss T-shirts um, if you can have a, a kind of a, if you like a skeleton assortment in shops, but you replenish and you supply particular online requests in a more on-demand way. So, um yeah, there's a lot of, you know, commercial and sustainable, you know, they certainly can work together and hopefully more as we go forwards. Yeah, it's a really interesting concept, uh, Tim, and one I think that probably I haven't heard a lot about. It's it's, it's very much in, in the process. It's it's a little bit new at the moment, but it's it's exciting. It's exciting to see those changes with the likes of Next and, and other ones like that, because I they're very future focused I find so there you, you see it starting with them and then hopefully it'll trickle down yes absolutely yeah yeah, yeah lots of mergers it's not lots uh, not so long ago Etsy you probably all know Etsy where you go for mm, yeah. um, you know homemade items which you know mm. are from small craftsmen artisans generally who are you know making things you know and they uh, bought Depop which is basically uh, an app for people to kind of sell their products, a little bit like Loanhood, except you're buying and selling, not renting and borrowing to each other. So um, you've kind of there got the world of bespoke meeting the world of kind of second hand. And, you know, they're quite different uh, propositions, but it's interesting that, you know, those two kind of businesses are now one. And you're going to get this, let's say, this blurring of different kind of channels. At the end of the day, as long as the customer, you know, they get the product that they want, maybe sometimes, you know, no, sometimes we won't probably buy exclusively secondhand. Some of us might. Um, but we might buy some. We might buy some new. But then we might buy, uh, give that on to kind of, you know, secondhand. We might rent for certain occasions you know we rent our music more people are renting cars than ever before uh and i think particularly you know you rent your your whole furniture for your house so the renting mentality the non-ownership mentality is, is something which is really growing and you know i guess people like apple people like spotify uh, and the like you know they're ones that kind of help to change this mindset that ownership possessions is not you know the be all and end all yeah yeah it's been an amazing time I've had with you Tim and and I'm really sad it's the last episode uh, that we've had together but we've had some amazing conversations and again check them out over the last couple of episodes that we've had and um, it's come to an end thank you so much Tim for being part of this amazing series all around retail and your real salmon of knowledge in that space so thank you so much just so if anyone wants to check you out you are on LinkedIn um, and you're quite active on that if anyone wants to reach out to you with any questions. Excellent. No, it's been a pleasure. Well, all good. Epi well, actually, most of the good series have six episodes, but uh, you never know. A line of duty went on for several series, didn't it? So we'll see on that one. But no, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for everybody who's been listening. And um, yeah, if you want to contact me on LinkedIn, I'm all, always happy to connect and, you know, answer any questions or queries that people might have. Um, you know community again retail is so much about community and everything we've talked about in the last four episodes we talked specifically people but sustainability shop location etc you know it's all about uh, community you ultimately you sell to people so you need to develop that so um, yeah so come and come and connect and uh, you might meet some interesting some other people as well thank you so much thanks Tim thanks thank everyone you. Bye, everyone. Bye.